Mm. Okay. All right. So, you know, it's been kind of a month of months, hasn't it? And I'm just looking at this passage, actually the entire chapter of, of uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. Because it really, it all goes together. And I was thinking, you know, what, what can take a relatively diverse group of people who have different ideas about things and maybe different goals and different plans and you know different experiences and different ages. What can take a group of people who who could go this way and that way and will forge them into a team? What is the one thing, really? I mean, I mean, it can come in different forms, but what is the one thing that can uh, cause people to come together and work towards a common goal? Catastrophe. Catast yeah, difficulties, right? Uh, con you know, persecution, whatever you want to call it. So you take a, you take a, you take any infantry squad out of the army and the marines. Okay. Talk about diversity. You're going to have a, you know, a country boy from Kansas. Okay, and a city kid from New York City. You're going to have whites and blacks and Hispanics and you know, who knows what, right? You're going to have different religions, and you're going to mix all those people together. And if you saw them, you know, in, in a tra maybe just in a training environment, you might think, man, these guys never get along. But you get somebody shooting at them, right? And everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. They become your best friend, right? Totally different background. And then, think about this, those that make it through that, 20 years down the road, when they're old, grizzled veterans. They still have a love for each other, don't they? They still, you know, give another guy a hug when they see him, in a, you know, if they see him on vacation or see him at the Wall of Deals or whatever, okay? There's a bond that occurs in difficult times. I think of the people that I used to work with, especially when I was their sergeant. We did some, we had to do some difficult things. And we saw some difficult things. Okay? I still have a pretty close bond with several of those people. I've seen two of them this year alone. Right? One was actually here in summer. I'm like, ooh, let's go have coffee, right? And I got to meet with one twice. The two, you know, two out of three times I was up in Idaho this year. And it's just, there's just something there. You know, remembering those things and remembering that, you know, we had each other's backs. Well, how does a church become a team like that? What does it take, right, for a relatively diverse group of people? Right? We come from different backgrounds here. Some people here, you know, religiously. Some people here, you know, might be, you know, expatriate uh, Lutherans and expatriate Catholics, right? Um, you know, we have we have members of our congregation who are former Mormons They're not here today. They're former Mormons, right? We come from all, you know, walks of life. Yeah, most of us are rednecks. Well, we might be rednecks by adoption. Right? If you live in the pine long enough, you will be a redneck. Okay. Jeff Foxworthy could probably say, if you're in the pine, you might be a redneck. Yeah, you might be. Okay. That's okay. I love rednecks. What, what brings the church together? Really, it's not the pastor, so to speak. Okay, but what, what brings that up? Because when things are all hunky-dory, right, and everything's going our way, and everybody's healthy, right, and, and the economy's good, and there's money in the offering plate to do stuff, what is there to bring us together? Tragedy. Tragedy brings us together. We've had a lot of it in the last, well, year and a half. Not just in here in this congregation, really community-wide, right? And, and those things, it's sad, right? It's sad that there will be more people who come into church for a funeral service than will show up in a church on a Sunday morning. Hmm? I would venture to guess most of the people who were here yesterday are not in church today. We're back. You're back, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But it's true. But tragic. 
tragedy brings us together, right? Tragedy takes our mind off ourselves and goes, oh, man, I need, to, I need to come alongside this person. I need to put my arm around them. I need to hug them. I need to put some love on them. It's okay to hug them. I don't care about a pandemic. Give them a hug. Okay? If you have to, put on a mask and sanitize your hands and then give them a hug. And then do it all over again when you're done. That's okay. Right? It's, it's difficulty and it's tragedy. Now, in much of the Christian world, I would call the world Christian, but in Christianity around the world, um, our trials and tribulations here are it might seem kind of trivial, right? Because there's people, there's people all around the world get cancer and die. There's people have heart attacks and die. There's people die, die of all kinds of disease things. There's people die of COVID, right? All around the world. Much of Christianity, their tragedy comes from absolute over persecution. And yet, look how strong their faith is in places like Nigeria and Sudan, Liberia, Afghanistan, Iraq. Not me. You may not think there's a whole lot of Christians there, but their faith is strong. I think probably far stronger than ours here in the United States. I'm talking Christianity as a whole. Because we haven't faced that yet. Okay? We're not even facing what, what some pastors are facing up in Canada right now. Right? Where the, where the pastor that's been arrested a couple times up in Calvary, now he's been ordered by a judge that when he that when he speaks, he has to give the 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 spiel of, well, this could happen to you, and this could happen to you, and this could happen to you, right? Even though he doesn't believe it. Right? He's it's almost like he's being ordered what to preach. In Canada, okay? Canada's not a whole lot different than the United States. You know, they talk a little different, right? But we're not far behind. So, Christianity should understand it's pressure, it's difficulty, it's hard times that bring a congregation together. And so Paul, as he writes to uh, the Christians in Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, if you want to, you know, try to pronounce it in Greek, we'll go Thessalonica. We'll give it the English pronunciation. That's easier. Okay? He's writing to them. Remember, the history of this, he was there for three Sabbaths, so three weeks roughly, before he got forced out of town, before people began to persecute those brand new believers, right, by having some of them arrested and drug off to jail. And so what we're going to see in chapter 3, we're going to see the heart of Paul. We're going to see the heart of a pastor, the heart of a missionary, where their heart sh should be. It should be the heart of every Christian. What is it that keeps us going? I've got to tell you, you know, I, I, I talk with some of the other pastors in town. We get together every once in a while. We meet on the side of the road, or maybe we have coffee, and sometimes we meet for lunch. And they're all experiencing in the last year and a half the same thing that we we're experiencing here. Not just a division because of COVID, but they're experiencing a lot of deaths out of their congregation for various reasons. Kind of an unusual amount. So we're not the only ones to have, you know, you know, two people out of our congregation die seven days apart. I mean, it's it's, it's just happening around us, right? We don't know why. And what keeps us going? And there's been times. I'm here to tell you, there's been times I just want to like, I don't want to deal with the emotional toll anymore. I would rather just go to my original plan from eight years ago and go be a hermit. See? Because if I'm a hermit, and if I'm not friends with anybody, then I don't have to grieve for anybody when they're gone. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? But God did not call us to be hermits, right? Besides, every, every real hermit I've met is pretty weird. <laughs> and I know I'm weird, but it's like, I don't know if I want to be that weird, right? So, you know, we just got to keep going. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 for just a few minutes. Now, Paul, just, to, just in, in, in the paragraph before, reminds them that they were taken away from them. They had to leave in short order. Right? They were forced out of town and they were going to die. Okay? 
So Paul says this, starting in verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So when he left Thessalonica, first they went to Berea. Okay? And then eventually they go, this is Paul and Silas and Timothy, and, and probably some others, they go to Athens. What's Athens known for? What is, what is Athens known for today? Greek, you know, Greek ruins, you know, polytheism, a, 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 you know, a shrine to every god. In fact, as Paul, as Paul walked through the, you know, basically the, the alleyway of, of, of shrines to all the gods, he found one called, you know, to, you know the shrine to the unknown god, right? And he, he took that and, and preached a great sermon there based upon the unknown god, the god that the Greeks didn't know. So that's where Paul, Silas, and Timothy ended up at, okay? But notice he says, when we could no longer endure it, he had to know what's going on in Thessalonica. And guess what? He couldn't just text them. He couldn't email them. Couldn't even call them on an old-fashioned landline with a cord. They didn't have such a thing, right? You could write a letter, but it would take weeks to go, and it might take weeks to get it back, and who knows if it actually get there. So the best way to find something out is to do what? Say, you know, at least send someone, right? Send a runner. Did we talked about that last week. A messenger, a runner, send a runner. So he sends, sends Timothy. Okay? And he does that because they could no longer endure waiting to hear what's happened in Thessalonica. Imagine. Paul's thinking, I've only been there three weeks. I didn't get, I only got, you know, three weeks worth of preaching. Now, Paul, he could, you know, he could preach all night long. You know, people would like fall out of windows and, you know, fall asleep and fall fall out the second story window and knock their head, you know, and die and stuff like that, right? He could really preach for a long time. But for him, three weeks was not enough. He needed to know. He wanted to know. Does that tell you about the character of Paul? Hmm? That he loves those people? That he only got to spend three weeks with? Now, Paul's a traveling man. I mean, he went on a lot of missionary journeys. He spent a lot of time on the road. I, too, am a traveling man. I like, I like to travel. I like to go and see different things and stuff like that. I don't necessarily like to fly. I like to travel on the ground. Okay? But even when I'm gone for a week, or maybe even two, if I get a two-week vacation, at some point I want to come back. I want to know what's going on here. I want to know... Who's still upright, right? Who's doing what? How are you doing with your kids and your grandkids? Or how is your puppy doing? Or things like that. I want to know. Paul wants to know. Okay? So he sends Timothy to establish, verse 2, to establish them and encourage them concerning their faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Remember, almost everywhere Paul and Silas and Timothy went, every time Paul went on a missionary journey, he left town not on his own volition, not, not because he wanted to. He left town because he had to. He left town because of persecution. They were appointed to that. We're appointed to all kinds of things. We might be appointed to health problems. Hate to say it. It's true, right? How many people were in here yesterday that heard Will's testimony and heard something from the Bible they'd never heard from before that would not have heard it otherwise? I would say at least 20. including his own family. Sometimes we're appointed for difficulties. 
Paul says this in verse 4, For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure, there he says that phrase again, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. They're appointed for tribulation, they're appointed for trouble, they're appointed for persecution, sometimes we're appointed for <coughs> terminal illness. And I can't answer the question why. That's how it is. What's most important to me, as it is important to Paul, is to know your faith. So I sat down with Will three months ago. I mean, he sent me the message that says, Doctor says I'm terminal. I got two weeks to two months. My heart was broken. So after I gathered myself together, that's when I thought, you know, I'm going to go sit down and we're going to get his story. I needed to know his faith. And he went out with as strong a faith as any I've ever seen. Continuing on in verse 6. So Paul, Paul sends Timothy to Thessalonica, and then Timothy returns and gives Paul an update. He says, hey, this is what's going on. This is, this is the good stuff that's going on. He probably also tells them they need to know some of this other stuff, but these are the good things that's going on. So Paul writes that in his letter. He says, but now the Timothy, 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 has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desire to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And that verse jumped out to me yesterday afternoon when I was home, chilling out a little bit, doing a little reading. It was like, Doom. like, look at that verse. That to me, that's a key verse. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. What are Paul and Silas and Timothy, what are they living for? Right here. It's in that little verse. They're excited, even though they're facing all kinds of troubles and trials, you know, and Paul had some kind of physical affliction, probably during this time period that we nobody really knows what it was, right? But he describes it in, in another book or another letter that he writes about his you know, thorn in the flesh, right? Whatever that is. All these things are happening to them. And yet, when he hears. Timothy's mouth about the steadfast faith of these young Christians, these new Christians in Thessalonica who are experiencing all kinds of terrible things. Okay? He says, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now I'm going to tell a little hunting story. Okay? You think, what does it have to do with this? It has everything to do with it. So when my, my youngest daughter, when she was a teenager, she wanted to learn how to shoot rifles, and then she wanted to shoot her own deer. Okay? So I trained her as I trained her in, in a most unique way. <laughs> I trained her by taking empty milk jugs, filling them with water, putting a little red food and coloring in them, and placing them in different places in the woods on my sister's property, because my sister put on like a big, huge spread in Valley Ford. It's like whitetail heaven, okay? Like, what a good place to train. And it's a good shooting area, right? And she had to go through there and find all these things and blast them with her rifle, okay? So she got where she was okay. You know, like, okay, you're good enough to probably shoot a deer at fairly close range. So then we cheated. Dad and I, we put up a two-person tree stand right behind his house. The little apples and corn or whatever out there, right, to kind of bait the deer. They're always out there anyway. And then my dad says, well, I'm going to sit in the tree stand with my granddaughter. And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? I'm a dad. <laughs> so I got an old metal folding chair, you know, like the old churchy chairs. And 
So I dressed in camel so I would look sort of like a tree, and I sat right, ne right next to this huge ponderosa tree. I mean, there was a couple of them right behind South. They were like this big around, big monster trees, right? And uh, they're, you know, 15 feet up in the tree stand, and I'm right next to the trunk. So they're kind of up there above me right there. <laughs> and this nice little four-point boat, he comes up the fence line behind us. <laughs> and I hear him come, and I look, and I'm like, oh. And he's like, you know, 30 yards away, but behind the tree stand, he's looking right at me, and I'm like, don't. Don't move. Don't look him in the eye. Don't, you know, you know. And I, and I want to film this whole thing. Well, I'm sitting in a chair and my camera is, you know, in the camera bag on the ground between my feet. It was like, <sighs> rats, right? So I was like, don't move, don't move, don't move. You know, don't scare this deer. And, you know, dumb buck. There's a reason that his, that his antlers are hanging in my daughter's bedroom in our house. He like, hmm. That's a funny looking tree trunk. And he walks out right in front of that tree stand. Right in front of her. She's up there, you know. And I'm like, oh, my heart's <laughs> pounding. Right? And I'm not even the one doing the shooting, right? I got buck fever like something else, and I'm trying to get my camera, but it's like, I don't want to move too fast, so I, don't, I, I never did get the camera out. <laughs> and I hear the safety come off on Hannah's rifle. Click. And I was like, oh. And that deer, he spins around, you know. Well, he does a perfect you know, you turn, stand still, and whack, she nails it. That was awesome, <laughs> right? And something that my dad said is the same thing I was thinking. It was like, now I've lived, you know, pretty much my world is now complete. I'm ready to die, basically. <laughs> because I was there with my daughter while I was at the tree trunk with my daughter, <laughs> right? <laughs> while she shot this deer. And it was just the coolest thing ever, right? You know, it's like, okay, my heart slowed down. I was like, wow. And of course, as soon as he hears that whack, and that deer you know, falls over, she goes, yes! And screams like that. I'm like, <laughs> that was funny. She was like 14 years old, maybe 15 at the time. That was pretty cool. Okay. By the way, gun people, she shot that deer with an AR-15. One shot. All she needed. <laughs> If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people say, that's not a good rifle. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is my daughter's hands, anyway. <laughs> so, Paul, though, he has that same reaction. When he hears that the believers, that small handful of believers in that town where you know, they had to flee for their lives, okay, when he hears that they are standing fast, that good news, when he hears about their faith and love, okay, and that they always remember Paul, Silas, and Timothy, okay, he says, now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Why do you think, well, at least pastors in a small town, why do we stick it out? Hmm? Why do we stick it out? Because... We don't, you know, I don't have to be here financially. I could, we could, well, you know, we have to sell some things, but, you know, we could survive just being retired. We never got to eat, but we could survive being retired, right? We stay. Gailey and I stay. Other pastors stay. Other pastors in Lapine stay. Pastors, you know, all over the world stay because when we see you stand fast in the Lord, it's just like, oh, yeah, now we live, right? When we see you get it, right? When we see the Word change you, when you see, we see you surrender another part of your life to Christ. It's like, oh, wow. It's like a little God shot. I saw that with Will, right? I mean, literally, for those of you who were here yesterday, when John and Kathleen dropped him off on at the door at the church when I was here one day, he was literally a wreck. He had been in a wreck. A bad one. Okay? He just got out of the hospital. I mean, this guy's, you know, I'm surprised he wasn't like in a full body cast. You know, you, you, you see that, you know, sometimes in the old TV shows where somebody's in a body cast and the leg is held up here. You know, all you can see is their lips and the eyeballs, right? 
that's almost what he looked like. He was a mess, right? He was a mess. He was, he was still drunk. Forget God's word changed him, right? He went from a man who only probably had faith in himself, if he had faith in himself, right? To a man who, through it all, and through you know the hardship of cancer and cancer treatments, and he stayed sober and stayed faithful. Right? He stayed in the work. He had hunger for it. Just in his last couple weeks of life, as as I could, because I was traveling at the time, I know that uh, Dave was sending him, you know, like daily Bible, you know, verses and encouragement, and I was, and he told me, you know, before he died, that he just really loved that. Okay. That's why we stick it out. We stick it out when you stand fast in the Lord. Verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Paul is thankful for them and I am thankful for you. It brings joy to Paul, and it brings joy to me and Gaylene, right? And it's a privilege to pray for you. And we want to see you. But mostly, we want to help you with whatever's lacking in your faith. That's the heart of ministry right there. Is to be there with you, to be there for you, to see you strengthened in your faith, especially when hard times are upon you. It's a privilege to come alongside someone who is suffering. Hermits don't do that. Right? A hermit just drives on by. A hermit becomes self-absorbed. Paul is not a hermit. I can't be a hermit either. It's a privilege and an honor to be there with you and walk through those things with you, even death. So Paul ends this chapter, he ends it really with a prayer. Okay, the last paragraph, verses 11 through 13, okay, is actually a prayer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this prayer as our benediction prayer for after the last song we're going to sing here in just a second. Okay? But it's a wonderful prayer. It's the prayer that if I was to write it out, I would want to write out this prayer for you. So let's... Um, have our music team come back up. We'll sing our last song, and then I'll close with this passage as a prayer. Okay? You back there. So we'll close with Paul's prayer to the Thessalonians. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And all his saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.